How's it going everybody? In this video, we're going to begin talking about our next topic, which is going to be a static source NAT, where we're basically going to set up a one-to-one -one NAT policy to allow external access from the internet to connect to internal resources in the DMZ. So this is a very popular thing to do in a lot of environments that I've worked in. So not to be confused with a end user that works for the company that needs to access a resource in the DMZ where they normally would use some sort of VPN connectivity, whether it's remote access VPN or site to site VPN. Here we're going to be taking any random user that doesn't work for the organization that needs to access something internally. So that's basically what we're going to be doing. So we took a look in the previous video at SourceNAT, but we were using DIP, the dynamic IP and port, where you're providing a whole bunch of internal users the ability to translate the RFC 1918 private IP addressing over to a single public IP. So we were able to take anything 10.1.10.0 slash 24 and add it over to 101.0.0.10. That's DIP. We also talked about dynamic where we take a range of addresses to another range of addresses and we dynamically allocate them on the need. We're going to be taking a look at it from the outside inbound now. So let's break this down just a little bit and understand the process. So basically what we're trying to do is whether we go through a telnet connection here or http or https if this guy right here needs to communicate with this guy right there we need to be able to set up a policy on this guy to allow that to happen static nat static source nat is the what is going to allow us to do that and it's a little interesting the way that it gets set up but basically the idea is when you're configuring it, you're basically having to match on the outside zone, saying if you get traffic that comes in on the outside, that you're going to allow it to talk to, in this case here, the sub interface zone in order to allow the communication. Now, in most cases, you're going to selectively lock down this traffic. So this traffic will get locked down. We'll do like Telnet and we'll do HTTP just so that we can provide those services that we need to. Now this will actually get moved up above the internet NAT. So because remember internet NAT is basically saying anything from Win 10 outbound to pretty much anything. So if we're going to be leaving the protection of our firewalled environment, so anything behind PA1, if we want to allow it to go out to the internet, we'd be able to do that. Now one thing we can that won't happen, at least in the testing that I've done, when we set up our source static NAT, we'll have to use the term bidirectional. It's a little checkbox that we have to check in order for this particular procedure to work, which the way that I've tested it, it's almost like you're allowing the communication to come in and then go back out if the source is out on the internet. But if the user is on the inside, or for example, maybe the web page or the web service that we're running needs to download an update or something along those lines, maybe security patches or whatever the case might be. If internet access is needed by that device, the static source NAT in my testing, it could be a limitation on the firewall, licensing, what have you, I don't know. But what I do know is if I open up a connection on the router 17 to try to go out to the internet or try to tell that to router 6 here, for example, it doesn't work. So I, if you want to allow your devices that will be reachable from the internet to be able to go out to the internet, so in other words, flows like this, you need to add whatever object, or in this case, your zone. So in this case here, the, the sub-interface zone, you'll have to add that to the source zone of the internet now. We'll take a look at that once we get to that point. But that's just my testing. It's not like a Cisco static NAT where regardless of what's happening, whether it's inside to outside or outside to inside, you've got a one-to-one -one mapping. So it doesn't seem like it works that way. I haven't, I've done a little bit of research to try to figure it out and looked up some YouTube videos and some blog posts and everybody seems to do it from the outside to the in. But I'm like, well, what if the inside needs to go out? Because security patches or whatever the case might be, then I have, the only way I've been able to find to allow internet access to those devices is by throwing them, by throwing the zone into the internet NAT policy and allowing it to go out. So 
there's that. There's also other options where you could do, where you don't have to add it to the internet policy for NAT, for the, your internal users just for internet browsing. You could go create a dynamic entry and allow specific IPs to map to specific IPs, you know, do a uh, dynamic mapping, so range to range. So there's a number of different ways that you can skin that cat, but it's up to you and to determine how you would go about doing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the screen. So the first thing that we're gonna do to get the NAT policy set up is we're gonna click on objects and I'm gonna create a couple of objects. The first object I'm gonna create is going to be iOS 17 uh, PVT IP, so private IP. And in here I'm gonna give it a 10.1.17.17 IP. Click OK there. And I'm gonna go ahead and say iOS 17 PUB IP for pub IP. Go ahead and put a underscore there and that's gonna be 101.0.0.17. Now they don't have to be one for one IPs. It could be completely different address ranges and that's the fourth octet IP of dot 17 does not need to match. But for the simplicity, it does make it easier to work with. Let me go ahead and put a underscore in there and let me just do PRV a and then an E for private. So PRI. Click on OK there. All right, so now we've got that squared away. Let me go ahead and just add LIC because now I'm like looking for cons consistency here. So yeah, my OCD is kicking in. So we have that. Now we're going to go to policies and we're going to click on NAT and then we're going to go to add. Right now we don't have just the internet rule. I'm going to come in here. The NAT policy is pretty straightforward. I'm going to call this iOS 17 static NAT because we we're working on the NAT policy. The original packet, the source zone is going to be, this is the destination from the internet. So we're going to, in this one here, we're going to specify that we need to map to, just like a, a the dip, we need to specify that it's going to be a the internal IP. So the source zone needs to be the sub interface because this is where traffic is coming from. Remember, we're trying to do a source static. So traffic will always be as if it's coming from the inside. But in this case here, this is going to, we need to map to the, um, the sub interface. So this, that's going to be the source zone. The destination zone will be outside. And then the destination interface will be the outside interface. Now, when it comes to the source address, we're actually going to map to the local IP. So we're going to add here and we're going to choose the private IP for the source address. Then on the translated packet, what we're going to go do is on the translation type, it's going to be a static translation and the translated IP, translated address will have to be the the public IP of the outside. So the translated address will be the public IP. We're gonna click on bi-directional and we're good to go there. So just to recap it, we say the we, we give it a name and then we give it we tell it the source zone is gonna be the inside zone, the outside zone is the destination. And we're going to be translating the private IP of 10.1.17.17 and we're gonna be translating that over to 101.0.0.17 is a static IP. We're gonna click OK. So that's gonna be basically how we do that. And then we're gonna scoot this guy up to the top. So now he's there. The security policy comes next. The security policy is gonna be a little bit more involved because we need to match on some additional information. So on the security policy, we're gonna come up here and we're gonna add. We're gonna give it the iOS 17 Telnet and HTTP policy. It's going to be an interzone policy. And then we're going to go underneath the source zone. Remember, this is traffic coming through the box. We need to match on the outside. And on the destination zone, destination tab, the destination zone will be, in this case here, will be the DMZ, or in this case here, the sub-interface. The destination address that we're trying to map is the public IP of who we're trying to reach. 
So in this case here is going to be the public IP there. The service that we're trying to match on is going to be, we're going to match on Telnet and HTTP. So that's basically where that comes into play. So we're just re recap. We're giving it a name, we're saying it's interzone. The source is going to be the outside zone. We're not going to specify anything for an address because we don't know where the traffic is coming from. The destination, we're sending it to the DMZ and we're but we're saying that the destination address is going to be pointing towards the public IP. That's where the traffic from the outside, so Jim Bob or Sharon or whoever is on the internet, this is what they need to point towards. And then we're going to go to application. We're not going to match on anything. The service is going to be Telnet and HTTP, and we're going to click on OK. So there's that. So now we're actually going to scoop this guy all the way to the top because we want him to be, he's more specific than the NAP policy. We're going to go ahead and we're going to commit this. Commit that, and then we're going to pause for the moment until this guy comes online. Okay, so we've got it committed, so we're going to click on close. So now what I should be able to do over here on Win 10-2 is I should be able to open up a putty session to the iOS 17 Telnet box. So we're going to click on him, load this up, and click on open. And we should get a prompt, which we do. Click on Rob, or type in Rob, and then Cisco. Boom, we're logged in. Now we should also be able to open up a web page to 101017. So we're going to go ahead and open up Firefox. That'll take a couple seconds for it to load. And there it goes. A little slow. Remember, this is all a nested environment. So we have that. So now we're going to come in here and we're going to go 101.0.0.17, hit the enter key. And so we should get prompted for a web um, login credentials for the web server. It's going to take a couple seconds for it to go out, but once it does, we should get prompted here about mid screen for that. And it's a little bit slow, but we're okay. There it goes. We're going to type in Rob and Cisco. Click OK. And then we're not going to save because we want to be prompted every time. And after a couple of seconds, we should get a web page. There's not, it's pretty simple, so it shouldn't take too much data to pass through, but we still have to be patient. And there it goes. If we come back over here to the monitor tab, we should see Telnet and web browsing going back and forth, which we do. 106006, because Win 10-2 is sitting behind router 6 and it's being natted. So we know we're good to go there. Now, if I was on router 17, so let's go ahead and pull this guy up. And if I was on 17 and I wanted to open up a, a Telnet session to router 6, this should not work. 106.0.0.6, right? It's gonna, it's gonna try, right? It's gonna try so we can see it's attempting to do it, but it's not gonna work. So what we have to do in order for this to, to work, even though it's bi-directional, bi-directional in the terms of Palo Alto from what I've been able to interpret, just means that if traffic from the inside, from the outside needs to hit the inside, and then the return flow needs to go back out, it's bi-directional. So, but in Cisco terms, if we were to do like a bi-directional config or a static NAT, you're pretty much saying, if I'm coming from iOS 17 and I want to go to Win 10-2, for example, you should be allowing those two pieces of information to con connect. And if anything from iOS 17 wants to go out, it's going to use the public IP of 101.0.0.17, right? And vice versa. If something wants to talk to router 17 from the outside, it goes to 101.0.0.17. Boom. It's problem solved. That's not how it appears to work here. So one of the things that I have to do on the policies tab in order to give iOS 17 internet access, I need to go back over here to the, the NAP policy. And then on the, the internet policy here, I'm going to go and actually add the subinterface to the original packet. So I'm going to add this guy here and click on OK. And then I'm also going to go to the security policy and I need to, on um, the internet policy, the source zone here is inside. I need to go ahead and say sub int. The destination we're saying is outside. Click OK. Commit that. 
and commit that. I'll pause for a moment until that comes back and we'll be in good shape and then we'll go from there. All right, with that in play, we should be able to, to retry this Telnet connection and it goes out right away. So we click and type in Rob and the password is Cisco. And after or Rob and there we go. So now we're connected. We come back over here to close this guy out. We go back over to the monitor tab. We should have multiple sessions open. We have Telnet going back and forth. Um, now, because the web browsing is on a per get push type of scenario, or get put, however you want to refer to it. Uh, we're not going to see the, the Telnet session or the web page come through until we actually reset, refresh it and then we'll see web browsing. So now, right now we have two inbound connections coming from Win10. We have an inbound Telnet and an inbound web, which is this one right here. This 106 here and this 106 here are both, so this guy here and this guy here. So here and here. These two are the inbound sessions from Windows 10-1. This one here is an outbound session from iOS 17 to router six to allow the communication to go back and forth. So that's basically how that comes into play. If I was to try anything else, it should fail. Like if I was to come over here to Win 10 and attempt to ping, I'll let it go ahead and pull up the um, me. There it goes. If I was to ping, 101.0.0.17, this should fail because I'm not allowing ping through the firewall. So this should fail and because it, because it should fail and it is, I would have to add ping as a service. Now, you could do this in just a test environment to verify that it's actually working, but I don't recommend you do that because what this could be used is for a recon attack. Well, it's not really necessarily an attack per se, but it could be used. So in a security policy, I'd have to go add in, uh, add in ping. But at the moment you add in ping, you're basically allowing anyone on the internet to ping this IP and to allow it to go through. And then they can start doing ping sweeps and a bunch of other stuff. So the more services you add, obviously, the larger your attack service becomes. So keep those things in, in your thought process as you're de developing stuff like that. So. That is how you do static source NAT. So we've covered that now. Until the next time, guys, thanks so much for stopping by and hanging out with me, and we'll catch you guys in the next video.